Good evening and welcome to our service of evening prayer as we gather on this Monday, the 18th of January. Wherever you may be this evening, I want to welcome you to this time of prayer together. We want to uh, just take a moment to say that we are now in the uh, continuing in the Epiphany season, the week of the second Sunday after the Epiphany. The church is also set aside today as the feast of the confession of St. Peter. In the, uh, in the scripture, Jesus asked the disciples, who do people say that the man, son of man is? And the disciples gave a whole range of answers. But then Jesus put the question directly to the disciples, who do you say that I am? And it was St. Peter who spoke up and who answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. And so we take note of that, but we'll be continuing in our readings through the Gospel of St. Mark, as we've been doing, uh, rather than using that particular uh, uh, saying, although I think that it's very important that we do acknowledge that this is the day for the confession of St. Peter, and we'll be remembering it in our prayers. Our friends in the United States are marking today as Martin Luther King Day, uh, his birthday was last week, and we made mention of it at that time, but they have set the day up as a Monday holiday. Looking back in history, on this day in 1779, uh, Peter Mark Roger, the British lexicographer, was born. He uh, was the uh, person who originated the uh, Roger's thesaurus, uh, if you're ever looking for just that right word to say what you want to say, the thesaurus is a wonderful place to, to find it. He was also an inventor. Among his inventions, a slide rule and a pocket chessboard. He was born in London on this date and died in 1869. So today is observed as Thesaurus Day. And on this date in 1882, a. a. Milne, the English author of the Winnie the Pooh books, was born in Hampstead, Middlesex, England, and he died in 1956. So today is also observed as Winnie the Pooh Day. A little bit of the history of Winnie the Pooh. Uh, in uh, Captain Harry Colburn of the Fort Garry Horse uh, Militia, uh, Calvary Regiment, Cal Calvary Regiment uh, was on the train heading from Calgary to uh, Nova Scotia to be put in place uh, in 1914 for uh, deployment to England. And while the train was having its servicing stop in White River in northern Ontario, he was out stretching his legs and met a trapper who had uh, an orphaned bear cub. And he offered the bear cub for sale and Captain Colburn was quite taken by it, and he bought the bear cub, adopted him, and managed to hide him uh, from other officers uh, as the train made its way. Well, this, this bear cub became the unofficial uh, uh, mascot of the uh, horse regiment, and uh, uh, Captain Colburn named the bear Winnipeg after his hometown. Well, they did make it to England finally, and his, uh, his regiment was going to be deployed onward to France. He knew he couldn't take the bear with him into battle scenes, and so he gave the bear to the Winnipeg Zoo, or to, excuse me, the bear had named Winnipeg to the zoo in London. Well, this bear became a real favorite of children. Uh, if people would knock on a door by the cage, the bear would come out and greet the children, even allow children to ride on his back. Well, author A.A. A. Milne brought his son, Christopher Robin Milne, with him to the zoo, and Christopher Robin just loved seeing this bear. But he had trouble saying Winnipeg, the name of the bear, bear and named, called it instead Winnie the Pooh. Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Winnie the Pooh. Makes sense. And uh, A.A. Milne began to write for his son stories about Winnie the Pooh and published them as a children's book. And along finally came Walt Disney, who bought the rights to the name. And as they say, the rest is history. 
uh, with all the, uh, the animated series on Winnie the Pooh. So this is Winnie the Pooh Day. In 1936, English journalist, short story writer, poet, and novelist Rudyard Kipling died at the age of 70. He wrote books like the Gunga Din and the Jungle Book. In 1907, he received the Nobel Prize for Literature, the first English language writer to do so. Two quotes I thought I would share from Rudyard Kipling. Uh, the first, very apropos, I think, an ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. And the second, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And that's a part of why I like to tell stories. I think that as we tell stories, we learn something. And so much of history can be told in story form. One more item from history. On this date in 1973, the final episode of Monty Python's Flying Circus was shown on BBC TV. It's been in, I think, near endless repeats ever since. I can never tire of the Monty Python humor. I think we've spent enough time now on history and let us turn to our prayers. O Lord, I call to you, come to me quickly. Hear my voice when I cry to you. Let my prayer be set forth in your sight as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Behold now, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. You that stand by night in the house of the Lord, bless the Lord. Lift up your hands in the holy places, and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth, bless you out of Zion. And now we turn to the psalm appointed for this day, Psalm 146. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, nor in any child of the earth, for there is no help in them. When they breathe their last, they return to the earth, and in that day their thoughts perish. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heavens and earth, the seas and all that is in them, who keeps his promise forever, who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord cares for the stranger. He sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever, your God, O Zion, throughout all generations. Hallelujah. And our psalm prayer, God, our creator and redeemer, inspire your people in prosperity or adversity to turn always to you, eternal source of life, health, and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now we do want to turn to our scripture. As I said at the outset, we are reading uh, from the Gospel of Mark and reading sequentially. And we're in chapter 2, and this evening we will be sharing verses 18 to 22. Again, a, a very short excerpt from this book. Uh, there is so much in so few verses and so much we can learn. So beginning at verse 18. Now, John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and the people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of 
unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh skins. Fasting can be an important right for Christians. There is nothing in and of itself wrong with fasting. The church, in fact, encourages the possibility of fasting during the Lenten season and at other appropriate times during the year. Uh, if, if you have gone through a period of fasting, perhaps you have seen its value in your life. But Jesus and his disciples were not fasting. Now, John, the baptizer, led a very ascetic life, and fasting was a part of his life. I don't see how a diet of wild locust and honey can be anything but a fasting diet. Yes, there is nutritional value in locusts, I'm sure. Now they're grinding up crickets and putting it into food and saying it's high in protein. Maybe not tasty, but John the Baptist did, fa did fast, and so did his disciples. The Pharisees tended to fast two days a week. Fasting could be very strict, not only abstaining from food, but sometimes abstaining from water, from alcoholic beverages, sustaining from sex, sustaining from bathing. All of those can be aspects of fasting. But Jesus and his disciples were not fasting, and so people wondered, why is that? And Jesus had an answer. He spoke of himself as the bridegroom. And he said, the guests do not fast while the bridegroom is present. As a matter of fact, the law permitted that. The law said that during the week of the wedding celebrations, that fasting was not to take place, even if a normal fasting day would occur. People were excused from the obligation of fasting uh, during the wedding feast. And Jesus saw himself as the bridegroom. He compared the kingdom of heaven to a wedding banquet. And guests did not fast at the banquet. They enjoyed the food and drink prepared for them. They enjoyed it perhaps to excess. They were times of celebration, of rejoicing. And Jesus brought an occasion for joy. And he then gave practical everyday life illustrations. You don't take an old cloth and put brand new cloth on it and sew it because that cloth will then shrink and it'll rip out the, the mending you had done to the garment and you'll end up with a greater tear than you had before. And he also uses the example of wine skins. Wine, when it's placed in the skins, will begin to exp expand as a part of the fermentation process. An old wine skin has already done its expansion. If you put in new wine and it begins to expand, if the wine skin has already been stretched out through the previous expansion as far as it will go, it's not going to expand anymore and instead it will burst. And not only will you lose a wine skin, you'll lose the wine that is in it. Now there is such a wine as Nouveau Beaujolais, released traditionally on the third Thursday of November. Wine that has been through its first in, uh, fermentation, uh, wine that has been gathered, has been harvested, but that special new wine, a Gamay wine usually, and uh, liquor stores have big promotions for Nouveau Beaujolais. I purchased it a few times. It has a bright sparkle to it, an amazing new taste. But many wines, of course, improve with age and are saved and savored. Uh, it's, it can be tempting uh, to drink a wine when it's very new. Nouveau Beaujolais is intended for that, but many other bottles are put aside, put aside to mature more thoroughly, and a whole new flavor comes from it. But Jesus is the new wine, the new wine, not appropriate for old wineskins. He has brought new and fresh ways of thinking. He has brought new ways of doing church new ways of doing faith and religion. The old wineskin of Judaism 
very appropriate in the old wine of Judaism, very full, very flavorful, just could not hold all the Christianity brought with it. No, I do not mean, and please do not understand me to speak against Judaism. I have many Jewish friends. I have great respect for the Jewish faith, but Christianity has gone beyond that. And we do not want to burst the lovely old wine of Judaism with the new wine of Christianity. So Jesus gives these examples, these practical everyday examples. But he also says that when the bridegroom is no longer with the guest, Jesus saw ahead. He knew that the disciples would not always have him uh, with them, that there would come a time when his life would be sacrificed, when he would be crucified for all of humankind. Then, then might be an appropriate day of fasting. And that is why in the Lenten season, as we prepare ourselves, as we walk with Jesus, as we walk with him toward the cross, as we join him on his journey to the cross, that is why in the Lenten season especially, we can think about, and if we choose to, we can practice fasting because it is a good Christian endeavor to do. But there are days of celebration. Fasting is inappropriate, for example, in the Easter season. It is inappropriate when we are celebrating our Lord's resurrection. Fasting is inappropriate at times of celebration, which is why even in the Lenten season, as we celebrate each Sunday the resurrection, Sunday is not a day of fasting for Christians. Sunday is a day of joy and celebration as we remember and renew each day our Lord's resurrection, his bursting forth from the grave, his giving to us the gift of new life. And the new wine of Jesus is the new life, our resurrection. So we need no longer fear death, for death has no hold over us. For because of Jesus Christ, we know that we have the gift of everlasting life. And that leads us then into our prayers of this day. Remembering that on this day, the, the church also celebrates the confession of St. Peter. We offer the prayer of this day. Almighty God, you inspired St. Peter, the first among the apostles, to confess Jesus as Messiah and Son of the living God. Keep your church steadfast upon the rock of this faith, so that in unity and peace we may proclaim the one truth and follow the one Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And then the prayer of this week. Almighty God, your Son, our Savior Christ, is the light of the world. May your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, shine with the radiance of his glory, that he may, may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. To the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And prayers for the evening. Be our light in the darkness, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all the perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. Guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Creator of the universe, watch over us and keep us in the light of your presence. May our praise continually blend with that of all creation until we come together to the eternal joys which you promise in your love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now I will invite you in this moment of silence to bring to our time of prayer your prayers and your concerns.
And now in whatever language you might choose, will you join me in that special prayer our Savior taught us, the model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go now in peace. May the God of peace go with you. Amen.